Good evening and welcome to the Monday, February 12, 2018 Board of Education meeting. Please rise and join me in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance, I pledge allegiance to, to the flag, flag of the United, United States, States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. So before we turn to the agenda, I'd just like to say what I think is really on everybody's mind, and that is that the last couple of weeks, the last two weeks have been a difficult two weeks, uh, both for people connected with the Guilford Public Schools, but also really for the Guilford community at large. Um, this we're going to talk about, I know Dr. Freeman is going to uh, give us uh, an update on some of the recent events and, and specifically the loss, the tragic loss of Ethan Song. Um, that I think we, we have learned really a, a, a lot out of this tragedy. I think the, the, uh, the fact is that the school community, uh, I've never been more impressed with how the school community pulled together. I, I know we all got comments, we all got uh, uh, thoughts uh, and, and uh, observations from, from parents and from kids. I know the, the administration, the leadership, the faculty, the staff, I, I just think they acted in an exemplary way in a very, very difficult time that really we hadn't, fortunately had been unprecedented for us up to this point. But um, I, we will talk about this a little more, but I, I just want to, on behalf of the Board of Education, thank not only the staff and the faculty and the administration, but also the uh, first responders uh, in Guilford, the uh, Youth and Family Services, uh, the police department, fire department, obviously, but also, uh, you know, just the community at large, because the, the community really showed what it means to be part of this of this town. And, and I, I, I love this town. This is a great town. But when when we join together after incidents like that, I I'm never prouder, never happier, never um, mm. more more honored really to be a part of this community. So I, I just want to extend the, the thought, the thanks of all, of all of us on the board to the entire Guilford community. Um, turning to the agenda, there is not going to be a student representative's report tonight. They are, go they are away, uh, all, at, all at some kind of an event from what yep. I understand. And we, we, we do need to add an item to the agenda, uh, 8.4 under the superintendent's report. Um, results from the State of Connecticut Next Generation Accountability uh, Performance Accountability uh, results. Uh, those results uh, were embargoed by the State of Connecticut until after the agenda was prepared. So we couldn't really talk about them, but now we can. So if there is a motion to add that to the agenda. So moved. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. So that's 8.4 would be re review of performance accountability yes. results? Thank okay. You. All right, uh, minutes. Um, there are a lot of minutes because of all the budget meetings, but 3.1 were the January 8th regular meeting minutes. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second? Second. Second. Any changes, corrections, okay. clarifications? Just a couple of minor changes. Um, <clears throat> under board agenda 9.3, um, just a uh, I would just add um, in the last sentence of the first paragraph with a budget of 92.2 million and a final project cost of 90.54 and add million. That's, um, that's reasonable. Yes. Mm -hmm. Add million to the uh, final project cost of 90.54 million. It didn't come in at $90. Uh, yeah. It would have been nice. But, um, Okay. Um, another small change, number seven, under student representatives, the first line, just making representative plural to representatives. Um, and then lastly, 9.2, um, let me just get there, sorry. Um, it reads that Mrs. Cohen explained um, about um, or highlighted some of the clerical and paraprofessional contract. I was actually not um, on that negotiation team. I believe that was Mrs. Sullivan who had highlighted the terms of the contract. Um, well, and by, yeah, it's, yeah it, I was it, just the, numbers, say, the numbers are actually not correct. If, if I may make mm -hmm. a, another correction, right, so the, the salary increase under that section should read 2.25%. 
for a total, so the total is the same. Right, right, right. right. Mm -hmm. um, and then I had, um, and I handed this to Terry um, for these minutes on page six, under 10.1, um, the policy committee report. It, it's a little confusing what we're trying to do, um, so I did hand Terry this correction. I'll read it out loud. Dr. Balistrace, you reported that the policy committee is reviewing a policy on sexual abuse education and school reporting requirements. They are looking to incorporate the policy regulation with the child abuse reporting regulation as the requirements are the same. Very good. Okay. Any other corrections or clarifications or changes? And all in favor of the motion as Aye. amended? Aye. 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 Okay. Sorry about that. Um, all right. Uh, January 18, special meeting. Uh, that's the meeting, I think, with the uh, principals, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Any changes or clarifications? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. All right. January 22nd is a public forum. Uh, is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Changes, corrections, clarifications? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. And January 23rd, public forum for the, on the budget. Motion to approve those minutes. So moved. Second. Anything? Any amendments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. And then January 29th, special meeting, uh, and that was the meeting to approve the budget uh, to move forward to the Board of Finance. Is there a motion to approve those minutes? So moved. Second. Second. Anything on these? Corrections, clarifications? I, I do, uh, Mr. Boss, have a yeah. correction on page four. Um, about halfway down the paragraph that starts, Dr. Bowles Tracy highlighted. Um, the, the second sentence, uh, I'm just going to ask if it could be stricken. It says, she also commented that she feels that the 22000 to help make an administrator available for the IB program is a relatively small investment. That 22000 is actually not for the IB program. I think it's just, it's confusing. Um, and really, I was highlighting that um, sure. the success of providing professional development would make that uh, having a the 22000 to extend an 11 month to a 12 month position was worthwhile. Just strike the whole sentence. Yes, I, I, I'm just, yeah. at, unless someone has a problem with it, I just think it's confusing and yep. it doesn't say an, anything that's accurate. Okay. Would that uh, change? Are there any others? Then all in favor of the motion? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, item four public topics, uh, public forum for topics on the board agenda. I don't see anybody that wishes to speak. Mr. Kazin, you were the reviewer of the expenditures. I was, and we discussed um, the many items of the warrant thoroughly and the financials thoroughly in the operations committee. So I'd move that we uh, accept the warrant, which totaled $2,238,463.29. In payments within the total expenditures and encumbrances of $4,785,231.93. Okay, motion's been made. Is there a second? Second. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. Uh, communications? If I, I'd like to suggest if people had communications <coughs> relating to the um, uh, the Ethan Song, uh, just hold off on those maybe for when Dr. Freeman is talking about that, because um, I think we all got a lot, quite a few communications about that. Any other communications, though, that we want to talk about? Okay. Um, all right, then we're skipping over number seven, and then so we're up to you, Dr. Freeman. Thank you, Mr. Boss. <clears throat> um, you know, I'll start by saying I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to say this any better than you did, um, but I did want to take a moment <laughs> and recognize here, um, as we all know, on January 31st, um, Ethan Song died. Uh, 15 year old freshman in our high school um, and while we um, share our sympathies um, with the family and with Ethan's friends and while we um, grieve for that loss like Mr. Bloss I could not have been prouder of our students or this school community or in fact the extended community in which in which we reside um, I watched this community come together uh, around that loss and around that family um, I was enormously proud of the way that um, our school staffs responded. And I'd like to point out not just the high school. Um, Ethan was a student in our school system from elementary school through. We had students who were grieving that loss 
at least at both the high school and at Adams. We had students who were um, shocked and saddened and confused by that loss throughout our school system. And we had staff members who had worked and taught Ethan um, at Melissa Jones, at Baldwin, at Adams, and at the high school. And so um, I watched this community rally around the people who were affected by that loss. Um, our leadership, um, Principal Walker and Principal Macenti, um, nobody can take a school through a loss like that except for the school principal. And they both did exceptional work, um, both preparing and then putting their own emotions aside while they took their schools through the days that followed. Um, our staff members uh, and our teaching staff uh, likewise set their own emotions aside and made sure that they were there for their children. And quite honestly, our students were exceptional. The way that they reached out to each other, uh, the students who stopped me in the hallway of the high school to ask me if I was okay on Thursday morning, um, they, were, um, they were mature, they were there for each other, um, and they supported each other. The community came out um, enormously. We had offers from every immediate neighboring school district, and we had offers from school, school districts as far flung as Farmington and Montville, wanting to know if we needed support, did we need um, support staff, mental health staff in the buildings. Um, the uh, therapy dogs were a tremendous asset. What started out as one dog, uh, David Myers came with his dog, Summer, in the morning, and by lunchtime, we must have had half a dozen therapy dogs in the school. Summer had the support of Canine FR as well, um, and the students reached out. By Friday, we had a therapy dog in Adams as well as the dogs that we had here at the high school. And it was particularly fitting because Ethan was a dog person. And so all of the friends who knew him not only appreciated having the dogs here, um, but thought it was fitting that they were here because of Ethan. And um, Guilford Youth and Family Services was exceptional. They were on site at the high school um, Thursday, Friday, and, and Monday following the event. They opened their offices um, Saturday and Sunday, the immediately following weekend, to continue offering services. Um, First Congregational Church opened their doors immediately Wednesday evening, hours after we learned of the event, to have a place for students to gather. They opened Thursday after school to give students a place to be together. And Thursday afternoon, um, that was staffed by uh, Youth and Family Services from Madison, because our, our support staff were simply tired. And Madison came, and their Youth and Family Services provided support to the children in Guilford. Um, it was simply an exceptional response to a tragedy that I hope we never experience again. But I spent the following days incredibly sad and yet incredibly proud at the same time. And, and I'll just finish by noting that tonight um, we play a high school varsity basketball game at Daniel Hand High School. And um, both schools are planning to white out the, the um, cheering section. Students are coming wearing white, both from Guilford and from Daniel Hand. There won't be green and black and gold in the audience. There will be white in the stands at tonight's basketball game. And the principals, coaches, and teams are meeting at center court to recognize Ethan before they begin the game tonight. And I think that's an exceptional gesture on the part of the students at Daniel Hand. And I just want to extend our thanks to them as well. Um, it's an exceptional community um, that dealt really, really well with an exceptional tragedy. And I was proud of every single member of this community. Anybody have thoughts or comments? I know we all have received from some communications from people um, kind of thanking the district for the help mm -hmm. uh, to the children. but. If, if I may, I mean, I, um, um, I was having a conversation within the last week with our first selectman, Matt Hoey, um, and one of the things I mentioned to him was that um, uh, I think one of the things that the response showed me was that when, as a school system and as a town, you build relationships with each other, um, the superintendent with the first selectman's office, um, you know, as, as one example of many, what happens then is, is that the rollout of the response is, is that much more coordinated um, and, and um, 
I, I, I just think that, that that was impressive. I mean, relationships with um, between our school system and Guilford Youth and Family Services are important year round, but um, but those kinds of collaborations and relationships and the time put into those really then shows itself brilliantly um, when it has to really step into action quickly. Um, and uh, so I just thought that was impressive and I wanted to mention that as well. First Selectman Hoey and <coughs> Representative Scanlon were um, immediately present and completely helpful and Chief Hutchinson in the Guilford Police Department mm -hmm. while they were responsible for their own work around this incident continually reached out and checked in with us in the schools to make sure that we had everything that we needed could they help keep press away from our schools could they provide um, um, officers in the building um, you know some of the dogs that were there were there with Guilford police officers um, could they help with traffic <coughs> control they were present at the vigil they were present at the wake they were present at the funeral while they were responsible for their own jobs making sure that we had everything that we needed they couldn't have been more helpful I think most importantly perhaps most importantly were the testaments of the children that were in the schools and expressing their gratitude and praise for a job well done um, by the administration um, and the members of the community and jumping you know forward and and having the therapy dogs on site and um, having support staff um, so that was um, it was just really great to hear and heartwarming. So, it's my understanding, there's a petition to make summer full time. Yes, I did, I did <laughs> see that. I did see that as well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And I, I, I want to just echo one thing you just mentioned, I, to, and to thank the press, frankly, for yes, for, no, for for helping to uh, not uh, make it more more difficult than it already was. I, I I know the press has got their job, and we all value that, and we think that it's it's a it's a vital part of our democracy. But I think the press understood that there wasn't really newsworthy value in staking out the school and taking pictures of kids at, at walking into the building and trying to interview people coming out of the building. It would have just been it would have just been too difficult. And so I really want to thank them for the the uh, the press for the discretion they used. Uh, it didn't have to be like that, but it was, and I think we should all uh, acknowledge that. And in fact, reporters like Zoe Roos from The Courier asking if there was information about supports that we wanted to get out into the community rather than asking if she could get quotes about how upset the students were. So members of the press helping us to get information out to our community rather than getting in the way of us getting supports to our kids. Thank you for remembering that. Also, I think as a as a board, we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge Dr. Freeman for his yes. empathetic leadership yes. mm -hmm. and being a role model for everything that you acknowledged Thank at the town. Much. Okay, well, so they, I guess let's turn to the. Um, <laughs> It's a little hard to really go to the just regular business after uh, with, with that, but at, just as the kids went to school the next day, so too do we have to kind of press ahead. Um, the 8.2 is the whole, I, I think Dr. Freeman, you've ta is to, is you're talking about the stress anxiety update, and that is to kind of look, as we're trying to do more globally, is to look at not some of these things like the homework policy and the start times and, and yes. transitions kind of as separate issues, but to try to uh, have some kind of a holistic review of what is it that we can do as a district to try to make uh, the, the educational experience uh, uh, more manageable. More. That's exactly right. And I, I did just want to update the board. I, I know that the board is aware that we have been looking at um, individual um, changes that we could make that would improve conditions here in the schools for students like the homework review that we conducted last year like the conversation that's been ongoing about the importance of appropriate sleep and start times for our high school students but as we have engaged in those piecemeal conversations I have come to recognize that from my position I need to be looking holistically at the systems and the structures in place and whether they help to insulate students from stress and anxiety or whether they contribute to student stress and anxiety. Um, we know that young, that young adolescents, that young children are experiencing increasing rates of stress, anxiety, school avoidance or school phobia and depression, not just in Guilford but across the nation. And so um, in my mind, um, I want to work hard not to look at 
individual pieces of a puzzle, but to try to understand the full puzzle. And so the first and maybe the biggest component is that we've been having a long conversation in this community about sleep. We know that it's important. We know that it insulates students from stress and anxiety and depression. And that's one of the pieces that we need to continue to pursue. But I don't want to get lost in the conversation, the fact that we're also looking carefully at school structures. Uh, we're looking at um, the ways that we talk about grading and the ways that we talk about achievement and how can we do that in a way that sets high expectations but is healthy for our students. We're looking at in-school supports. How do we identify students who are struggling with stress, anxiety, or, or school avoidance? How do we identify them early and how do we support them and help them <coughs> to um, address those concerns and work through those concerns. And additionally, as has been mentioned a couple times during the budget project uh, process, we're also looking at transitions within our schools and we're thinking very creatively about trying to reduce the number of transitions because transitions, especially for middle school age adolescents, can be very disruptive. And if they are going to be one more hurdle or one more contributor to stress and anxiety, then we need to ask ourselves honestly, are those the right structures and should we try to reduce transitions, have fewer of them and do better with our work around a smaller number of transitions. Um, in that effort, um, I have been meeting with groups like Guilford Day, uh, Guilford Mentoring, Guilford Youth and Family Services. I've met uh, informally with a number of the local private clinicians with whom we work in the community. Um, with or without Dr. Kanapari, who has joined me for some of these meetings. We have met with the faculties at Guilford High School, Adams Middle School, Baldwin Middle School. Uh, we've met with about 80 student leaders here at Guilford High School. Uh, I have begun to have this conversation with a number of PTOs in the community. Um, and, um, and we met with um, the local leadership of all of the, the youth at volunteer athletic programs that support the same population of children here in the Guilford schools. Um, so I just want the community to be aware, as the board is aware, um, that the conversation that started with sleep um, is bigger than just sleep. And, and we need to be thinking about a system that um, facilitates the work that we do, not a system against which we have to, to labor or fight as we do the work of educating our students. And so as we continue these conversations, I know that this, the Start Time Task Force is hoping to have recommendations to be made to this board. Um, I, Jenny Brown is meeting with all of our in-house um, mental health support positions. She has been tasked to have a list of recommendations back to me by the end of this school year. And as recommendations around those various topics come together, I, I want to assure this board and this community that I will work to always present those as part of a full environment that strives to be healthy and tries, strives to support our students rather than an environment which contributes to the stress and anxiety that we know students are laboring with um, in, today's, in today's world. Questions, comments, thoughts? Well, I would just say that I, I really appreciate and, and think it's important that we look at the um, the issue of stress and anxiety is both um, an issue that we have to, you know, work to prevent with students, as you're talking about with the homework and the start times, but also something that we do have to address, that we do have children who are actively um, experiencing symptoms that are pretty significant, um, and we have to have the resources um, to, to help them. So they're, they're really two different groups um, that we're trying to support. It's a big, big project, but I think it's important to, to do what we can both both areas. So I appreciate your work. It's an important conversation. We'll have more on that moving forward. Well, and just to put it out there so it's really clear, when you talk about reducing transitions, that, that is changing this, the alignment in grades 5 and 6 and 7 and 8, and so that Baldwin would be a 5th through 8th grade school for, for the maybe the lakes and the maybe the lakes and the Jones district and Adams would be a 5-8 school for the Cox and the Leet district. Now before anybody says oh my gosh what are they doing that this is a, a topic of discussion this is a Correct. possibility this is not something that we've decided is a good thing to do there is obviously I think we all understand that whenever any kind of a change like this uh, is comp contemplated that we have to get out and talk about it and see what see what people think see if people think it's a good idea or not and and if not 
can something uh, be done about that, or and if so, uh, when could it possibly be implemented? So it's just a, it's a, it's something we're looking at. Um, it is not done, but um, yeah. it's an idea that I think merits further exploration. And we're at when it comes to uh, restructuring of the middle schools, we're very much at the beginning of that exploration. When it comes to thinking about start time, we've done some good work and are further along in, in that particular item. But I. I, I have come to understand over the last several months that all of these pieces need to always be discussed as parts of a larger environmental whole and not as any individual um, standalone panacea because I don't believe that there's one standalone panacea. Okay. Um, do you want to just update us on where we are and the, uh, both the town budget and the state budget? Um, so locally, um, I would start by simply again thanking Mrs. Trudeau and our budget office for the work that they put in and thanking this board for all of the work that you put in in finalizing our budget um, on January 29th. <coughs> Important for the community to know that now that the Board of Ed has a budget for this year moving forward, um, that later this week on the 15th, Mr. Bloss will be sharing that budget with the Board of Finance at, at their meeting. And on March 6th, it is important for the community to realize that that would be the first public hearing, the Board of Finance holding their first public hearing on um, both the school and the town sides of our budget as those move forward. Um, and Mr. Bloss and I will both be there on March 6th to present the school side of the budget, to answer questions from the Board of Finance, but I think most importantly to answer questions and to hear comments from the community. Um, we have had really, um, really positive community support and involvement in this year's budget process. I think more than I've seen in past years. It would be really good to see that continue as we move through. Um, and then ultimately on March 8th, the Board of Finance has their um, final workshop where it's likely that they will approve a budget on both the town and the school sides that would then move to town meeting and ultimately to referendum probably in early April. <clears throat> um, Correct. Along with that, it's important to note that there has been some press time um, spent at the state level uh, on the governor's um, budget proposal. So the governor has made suggestions around the budget. Um, the governor's suggestions include further reductions to ECS, the educational cost sharing um, grant. Um, so at this point, um, we know that ECS has been reduced and that we'll be receiving fewer dollars than we have received in past years. But again, to Guilford's great credit, um, that figure falls within the adjustment that the Board of Finance made to their anticipated ECS revenues last year. The governor has suggested an additional $290,000 reduction. It is only the governor's proposal. It has not been approved by the legislature. But even should that additional $290,000 reduction come to pass, it still falls within the adjustment that the town made to their anticipated revenues on an ECS last year. Now, I know the town has lost other revenues additionally, so while it falls under the reduction they made to the ECS, it probably doesn't cover all of the reductions that the town experienced overall. So as we move through this budget process with the Board of Finance, it will be important for us to participate not only in the side of the discussion around our operating budget, but to be available to answer questions and to discuss the revenue side from the, the state into Guilford as that budget moves forward this year as well. We'll continue to monitor those discussions in Hartford. I don't think it'll be a full 290,000 additional dollars, but we'll need to <coughs> continue to monitor that. I, I did talk to Representative Scanlon briefly uh, over the weekend and he, he reminded me that a year ago when we were talking about the governor's proposed budget, it zeroed us out. And that would have been a $3 million hit. And we wound up having about a two point, or uh, getting benef uh, approximately a half a million dollar hit when we budgeted for a million. So he, he urged uh, patience <laughs> and calm. Uh, and uh, so on. Well, it works. We should, do, we should do that, yes. And for the last piece of my report, I just want to note that on Friday, um, the state released the, the accountability report um, for the 16-17 school year, and I will turn the remainder of my report over to Dr. Keene, who will share uh, that report and those results with you. Thank you. Um, 
as Dr. Freeman stated, we did have these results a couple, for a couple of weeks. We've been looking at our own data, but it wasn't until Friday that we could see everybody's data and have a way to uh, look for reasonableness. So we've been doing some work over the weekend, and uh, we're happy to share some of our findings with you. First of all, uh, just as a reminder, accountability systems um, are for, you know, have several purposes. One is to track progress and help us make uh, improvements, show us where our support is needed most, uh, to recognize success, promote transparency to the public, and to satisfy federal and state requirements as part of the ESSA um, laws. Most importantly, though, um, our particular accountability system is not just about test scores. It's really a complete picture of a school or district to the extent that is possible. It does guard against narrowing the curriculum just to tested subjects. In other words, the arts are involved. Uh, PE performance uh, is also involved. It expands the ownership of accountability to all the staff including our support staff, our social workers, our school psychologists, um, our counselors. Everybody is involved in this, so it's not just um, the third grade teacher who teaches language arts and math or the uh, seventh grade science teacher. So it becomes a school-wide project. And it is, it encourages leaders not to view accountability as gotcha, but as a tool to guide and track our efforts. So the state looks at 12 indicators, and this they collect data on our performance in science, language arts, and mathematics, our growth in those areas, our participation rate, our chronic absenteeism, which is defined as students who miss more than 10% of a school year. Coursework for post-secondary and career read readiness, which could be things like um, vocational courses, or it could be AP, or um, college, you know, or some of our uh, classes that also are, have college credit. The exams, or the actual results of those courses, our graduation rates, on track in ninth grade just means that they have passed at least five classes, our post-secondary entrance rate for two and four-year colleges, physical fitness and the arts. So those 12 indicators we really have to pay a lot of attention to. Those that have a little H beside them means that not only do they we're looking at the um, data for all students, but we're looking at the data a second time for just our high needs students. And high needs is defined as students with disabilities, students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch, or students who are English learners. So that cohort of those three categories uh, becomes a second look. You have a copy of our report, which um, I'll tell you a little bit more about, but this is our report. You can see that the index or the rate is uh, actually how we performed. Uh, these are the targets, and this is a number we really pay attention to because this is the percent of the target or the goal that the state sets for us. So you can see they were expected to get at least 75% of performance on all, but we're expected 100% of growth. Now the growth is individualized for every student. So depending on their scale score, they had a growth target and what should be reasonable. Some children exceeded their growth target. Some did not uh, actually went backwards, but we were hoping for 100%, an average of 100%. Uh, to exceed. Then you can see some of the other indicators and they're all numbered here. You'll see three is missing. That's the participation rate and I'll show you that in a second. But you can see, for example, in 4A, chronic absenteeism, all students. We want to be less than 5% chronically absent. 
but in 4B, it's the chronic absenteeism for our high needs students. So there's a 4A and a 4B there. Mm -hmm. Those are those ones that are broken out again. So this is the Guilford report. This number that's highlighted in yellow, this 84.2 became our, what we call our district performance index. Schools also got a report like this, and theirs would be a school performance index. So the very first thing we do is look at uh, our scores or our index as compared to the previous index from last year to see if we're going in the right direction and see where the patterns are. You can see that uh, these little arrows mean we either stayed the same, went down, or went up on each indicator. And we actually review every single indicator to make sure that we understand why they are like they are from last year to this year, because it's always about continuous improvement. There are also things called gaps. If a district or a school is, uh, has an achievement gap, that means it is substantially different from the average statewide gap in any subject area. That can be for all students or for just high needs students. <coughs> And the same is true for a graduation gap. And substantially different means um, one standard deviation um, difference from the state average. This is Guilford's number three. Their participation rate is listed here. I'm very proud of this. It shows that we are not trying to hide any children. Um, 99.5 is the lowest in any particular area, which probably is one child that we uh, failed, to test. failed to test for whatever reason, um, or maybe more than one child, or just a, but less than five. So that is uh, really amazing. Schools are expected to have 95% or above. This shows where the gaps could occur, but as you can see, here's the size of our gap from our not high needs based on our non-high needs, and where they look at the gap and compare it to the state gap, and we are below the state gap. So we do not have a, a Y in this column. That is important because when the state recognizes um, schools and districts of distinction, um, you cannot be a, a school of distinction unless you're in um, the top 10% and have no outliers or have no gaps. So Last if- Last year were we, <coughs> wasn't this a Y last year? Not for the district, district but we did have um, a couple of schools that had gaps, and, and we still have a couple of schools that have gaps, for different reasons, actually. But as a district, we do not. Okay. okay. So um, this is a, a slide that um, I, it always scares me to, to look at this, because it is comparative data, and it's relative. It's still not at 100%. But when we look at our district reference group, which is district reference group B, and these are all the, the schools or districts in our dis district reference group, and this is their district performance index. And you can see Guilford is number two in our district reference group. Number one, number one is Greenwich. Greenwich. But you'll notice that some of these have an asterisk. Those districts with an asterisk also have an achievement gap as, as the district level, okay? At the district level, mm -hmm. yes, okay. Could be for graduation purposes or performance purposes. So I don't have a slide up there, but we also looked at, at the statewide, uh, and looking at K-12 districts only, we are actually number four in the state. 
seven overall, fourth in the state when you look just at complete K through 12 districts. Right, it's not fair to compare a district right. that's only got a high school. Uh, right, or a K six district. Or a K six district. Yeah. yeah. So, so I, like some of the regional high correct districts. Yeah. So the, the 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 top four districts in the state of Connecticut, in order, are New Canaan, Darien, Greenwich, and Guilford. K twelve districts. K twelve districts, not 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 bad. No. Nope. In fact, really good. That's that's, that's, that's not shabby. That's really good. No, that's a, hey, look, you know, we're we're in the same. Yeah, I mean, it's it's outstanding. It's outstanding. And and I would point out, you know, we, we always caution about those measures and those rankings, but I feel better about this accountability index mm -hmm. rather than raw test scores. Again, this includes um, graduation rate. This includes access to the arts. This includes physical education mm -hmm. and and and. Attendance. Yeah, and attendance. And so, in my mind, that while this is still weighted to test performance, it begins to take other measures into account. And that was not something that we had at our disposal when we were participating with the Connecticut Mastery Test. And so, um, it's not just raw test scores. And so, you know, I always get nervous about rankings. I always worry about, about rankings. But it certainly indicates that we are doing um, well, that we're making good decisions, and that the decisions are not simply about test performance or test scores. Right. Can you repeat those four again? Um, New Canaan was the first with 89.1. Greenwich was two with 86.3. Darien was three with 85.7. And then Guilford, 84.2. Just because I'm getting ready for the Board of Finance meeting on Thursday, uh, I, I thought, well, I don't know, why don't I look up the OPM uh, numbers uh, from the Municipal Fiscal Indicators to see where we are compared to the three towns ahead of us in terms of per-student spending. Is that a shock that I might have done that? Um, we are, we are set, you know, it's hard to believe. It's, uh, uh, but we are 78th in the state of Connecticut in per-student spending. New Canaan, which is three places ahead of it. Well, we, we spend $16,865 per student. Uh, New Canaan, the first ranked school, spends $19,576. In other words, about $2,700 more than us per student. Greenwich spends per student, no wonder they have later start times, $21,238. $21, That's about $4,500 per student more than us. Wow. Uh, Darien, uh, third place, is, spends $19,314, in other words, about $2,500 per student more than us. And then there we are in number four. So um, in the town right behind us is Farmington. They spend a, a little bit less than us, but it's very close. So uh, no, I think this, this is, in terms of return on investment, I think this right. is pretty compelling uh, data. Mm -hmm. um, if we were, uh, if, 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 if we had, to, the extra four thousand or forty-five hundred dollars that Greenwich had well, that would be what somewhere in the twelve million dollar extra in our budget yeah, range, uh, something dollars. like that. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, for the for the return on investment, I think this is out, outstanding. Yeah. A lot of. That's good. Yeah, go that's good question, uh, Dr. King. Um, I'm looking at this schedule that you handed out and the. It talks about uh, ELA average percentage growth target all students, mm -hmm. and we were fairly low on that. And then also the same growth target for high need students, and we were exceptionally low on that. Um, what are they talking about here? I mean, what? Why? Why are we troubled? Well. Um, first of all, it's about individual growth, and there each student has a growth target. And so when they say, okay, this was the average growth target for all students, and how many achieved their target. And so on this one for ELA, 62% of our students achieved their growth target. Some of those students would be students who are already performing at the very yes. highest levels of the test, and therefore their area in which to be able to grow is, is, is minimal. Yeah. And so it weights the growth of students 
all across the spectrum. The old system mm -hmm. only measured moving students from, from a low band into an mm -hmm. acceptable band. This says that even your students who are performing at the very top of the very highest band, there's still an expectation that those students will continue to show growth. It gets very hard to measure where you're at the very top okay. of the scale. And uh, you can see that also last year we were very high in ELA and not so high in math. We put all of our efforts into mathematics and we really started focusing on it. And one of the questions we're asking is, did we let up? Mm. And so that's one of the things that we're really looking at um, and looking hard. Even though our performance <coughs> in ELA is still high overall, our absolute performance, did we grow enough? And so growth counts about 40% from 40 to 45 percent of the total accountability index. Mm. Growth counts much more than absolute performance. <laughs> to us, that is again one of the improvements mm -hmm. of the SBAC compared to the Connecticut Mastery Test. It's not just about looking at the students who are on the fence between one band and another. It's not just looking at students in the lowest tier and trying to move them to an acceptable tier. We have an obligation to every single child, regardless <coughs> of if you're at the very top, um, to make sure that they're experiencing individual growth. And we think that this is why this is a better assessment for Guilford than the CMT was. Can I ask a question? This is um, uh, collated across the whole district. Were you able to look within, we'll say, elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools? Were there any outlier, I'll say outlier schools? Was there areas that were maybe pulling some of these numbers down, or was everything pretty consistent across all um, developmental we levels of schools? We didn't look across uh, groups, yeah. like elementary versus middle right. versus high, yeah. uh, and because they're really not comparable. Uh, mm -hmm. When we go back to those 12 indicators, yeah. they... Elementary only uh, Yeah, is only, only has four maybe... Of them. I see. And I high see. school has all 12. I see. And mm -hmm. however, each principal has their own reports, mm -hmm. and I am having individual meetings with every single principal to go over their data, to look at it carefully. Tomorrow I'm meeting with all four elementary principals that we can talk about what are elementary measures and what are we doing about it now. One of the things that I think we can attribute to um, our good performance is that people are really paying attention to this, uh, not in a bad way, but in a way that says this is important and we need to pay attention to it. Um, so I can't say that there is a particular outlier in a particular area, but we're certainly having lots of meetings about that now. And uh, they're really, uh, you can't really compare, for example, you can't compare a Baldwin with an Adams. They don't even have the same indicators because there's some eighth grade indicators that Baldwin will not have. So, but we are looking at each individual school. Um, here yeah, is the school's report so that you can see how each school fared, and, and it's, this is public information now, and I'll show you where everything can be found. You can look at every school in Connecticut. So um, we do have two achievement gaps, uh, once, one at uh, Cox Elementary School and one at Guilford High School. Because those are um, uh, gaps, that puts them in a Category 2 automatically. Calvin Leap, Melissa Jones, uh, Guilford Lakes, and Adams uh, are all considered Category 1 schools. And I just want to make sure. But it's I worth this. noting that Cox, Jones, and Lakes essentially have the same accountability index, but Cox is still identified as a 2, not a 1, because of the existence of a gap when you look at the high need students compared to the rest of the population. And so the numbers can be different than that ranking. Again, Greenwich outperforms us on the index measure, but has mm -hmm. a gap and we don't. And so there's no direct correlation. Can Correct. you explain why Baldwin seems to be the outlier here? I mean, you said that they have different indicators, but. Uh, Baldwin doesn't have different mm -hmm. indicators, but that's what we're looking at now. We know that um, there's, there's a big jump between fifth grade curriculum and sixth grade curriculum. Um, and 
you know, we're meeting about that now to try to figure out, okay, what, what is going on? Why is that uh, report as it is? Um, is this, is, is Baldwin's uh, score l l worse than last year's? I would have to go back and check. I'm not for sure. Okay. Uh, I know that they had some major changes in the in the near past. Uh, their schedule changes would All be right, different. The way on. they structured classrooms would be different. But we're taking a good look at that now. I met with uh, the Baldwin principal and the assistant principal this afternoon. So they, you know, just from the news reports, there were three quarters of the district and districts in the state where the scores went down yeah. mm -hmm. and that strikes me I don't know you're you're more into statistics than I am but so it strikes me that unusual. that's well but that's a that's a, a setting right. the goals differently mm -hmm. uh, in yeah, year no, two no, that, there, right, right. A, right that, that doesn't happen by itself no, no. But Ted, that's exactly the sort of question that we ask. And so mm -hmm. when this data comes back to us, we then sit with the principals, the principals sit with the teachers. This should give us good questions to ask. Right. It shouldn't give us any answers. It points us in certain directions, and then we need to make thoughtful decisions about what we find. And Dr. Keene, is um, the reason Baldwin categorized as two because they're below <coughs> a certain performance? Okay. Okay. Uh, category two um, are in the second quartile. Or with the existence of a gap. <coughs> or with or the existence with Baldwin of doesn't have the gap. No. So, yeah, they're right. in the second quartile. Oh. No. Yeah. Uh, it is worthy to note, and um, this is also in the press release, uh, three of our schools were uh, named schools of distinction, and that was Calvin Leet, Melissa Jones, and Guilford Lakes. Um, in fact, there were two distinctions given to Melissa Jones and to Calvin Lee for the highest growth and uh, for highest performing. So what are our next steps? Like I say, um, I'm having individual meetings uh, with principals. Uh, Paul and I have had many meetings. Uh, we are scheduling our spring uh, assessment administration. One of the things we want to do differently this year is uh, last year we changed. We did math first. Our math scores went way up. <laughs> and we're like, did changing that order have something to do when we think about test fatigue and those kinds of things? And so one of the things we're doing this year is we're going to try to have two first-time assessments. So we're going to start our assessment before spring break with our ELA. We're going to have the spring break off and then the week following that off and then we're going to start again so that we are not just doing testing for two weeks straight. For two right. weeks. So we want two first time experiences to try to battle any if fatigue. Uh, could be. Could be. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna try it. Uh, we are verifying some, uh, some of our data submission. We saw that maybe some of our um, submissions aren't as accurate as they should be. So we're looking at that now. We're verifying that all these numbers do make sense to us or did we um, report something incorrectly. We're having conferences or notifications to parents about absenteeism. Sometimes parents don't realize um, their child has been missing as much as they have. Uh, especially if it's a day here and a day there. I'm not talking about someone that, you know, was in the hospital for a couple of weeks. We're also doing um, interim assessment walks on online. We're uh, giving kids some tests around the content that we've been teaching, but then we're analyzing those and we're looking at the item construction because sometimes the students aren't, just don't understand what the item is asking them to do. So we've been doing a lot of work around that this year. Um, the math and literacy coaches have been working um, at each school as part of their goals to make sure that you know students are, are really clear and teachers have some information that they can do something about now, not at the end. All of that is going to be done in the larger environment of continuing to focus on the things in which we've been focusing. Right. We're getting good results. We know mm -hmm. that we're making good decisions. And 
I mean that in light of the conversation we had just a few minutes ago about stress and anxiety mm -hmm. as well. This is one of the most important things that we do, but if our students are not healthy and happy and well, then, then that, that begins to pale in importance. And so while we are proud of those numbers and will continue to work towards those numbers, we're going to make sure we do it in an environment where our students are healthy and happy and well. That was one of my questions was, this is all wonderful information, but is there a way to measure or I, there isn't, you know, the health and wellness, the like mental health and wellness of our students in reflection of such high achievement to make sure That's that going to yeah. this stress and anxiety component, you know, it's wonderful that we have these results, but at, at well, hopefully at not a great cost to the health and wellness of the we, yeah. we really try to not overemphasize testing in Guilford. Right. We don't make a big deal out of it with the children. We um, won't be holding a press conference on this. No, and, and we don't, um, you know, really, you know, do test prep. No, we that's not what I was, I was that. Do you feel like this measure is a more holistic measure than Absolutely. other measures? You yes. Know? It's yeah. beginning to move in the right direction. As right. I said, it's better than when we just took raw CMT scores and ranked mm -hmm. the state that way. It's beginning to look at other measures, but we still constantly need to balance it mm -hmm. with what we see, with what right. we experience in the schools. Right. Um, right. And always being responsive to the demands of our community, right? The community does demand high expectations. Mm -hmm. It does demand prepared students. Mm -hmm. So how do we continue to do that and, again, not fight our own systems? And so can right. we continue to have these high expectations but allow for more sleep and reduce some mm -hmm. transitions and make sure that we have supports in place so that we don't have to compromise our expectations in order to lower the stress? How do we balance it in a way that students feel proud of their accomplishments, not stressed by the pressures? Right, right. Um, yeah. When I figure it out, we'll let you know. <laughs> the grand question. Well, one of the important things here is saying that all kids matter. Right. And it's not just about... Um, the highest achieving. Right. Yeah, the highest achieving students. It's students with special needs. Students, I mean, every single child is counted in this. So, you know, there are no children that are ignored um, and uh, or left out. They're, they're all important and they're all expected to to grow and to thrive um, in, and, and to learn. And so we have to work on that. How do we help make that happen in a positive way? Because if they're stressed, they're not learning. So we have to look at that. And if they're really stressed, they're not coming to school. And we really have to look at that, too. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's not a perfect measure, but um, I think it's one indicator. All of the information that I've shared with you, plus a lot more, is at edsite.ct.gov. That is where all the data and statistics and reports for the State Department of Education um, is housed, or are housed and you can see all of the schools and districts there. Can we get a copy of this presentation? Yes, you may. I'll send it to you today. Yeah. Right and the curriculum committee may want to look at this a little later in the year um, mm -hmm. when we've got a little yep. more data mm -hmm. and a little more um, review of it. Just a suggestion. Any other questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, I, I was just going to say, under your... Um, your chronic absenteeism line, and you said one of the ways that uh, you're going to address that is to maybe have conferences with parents who have children who have been mm -hmm. absent more than you expect. It really gives you an opportunity to um, dovetail with, with some of the mm -hmm. issues you've brought up about school avoidance and mm -hmm. anxiety, maybe even depression, yep. and maybe bringing that up as, as you know, a, a potential reason why, why there might be more absenteeism. So it really gives you that opportunity mm -hmm. to, to be able to, to be in two things at once. Exactly yeah, right. Absolutely. Which is great. Right. Those yeah. parents might not otherwise reach out. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Thank you. Okay. Any, Thank you. Anything else? All right. And I think we you know we can talk about this later in the year, I think when we have some some more information when, you, when you've had a chance to uh, look at it more. So uh, but again terrific. Uh, it's a uh, it wouldn't be a shock if we mentioned this at the Board of Finance meeting on Thursday. <laughs> uh, 
It'd be a shock if you didn't. Yeah, it would be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, all right, next item on the agenda is we're on the board agenda. The 9.1 is to act on a personnel item, uh, ratify the appointment of Nicole Carangelo, grade three teacher at Cox Elementary School. Is there a motion to? I, I just want to note that this is uh, a position for one year only through the end of the school year is to cover a medical okay. uh, absence. Is there a motion to ratify Ms. Carangelo's appointment? So moved. Second? Second. Any discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? All right. You have a new teacher. <laughs> um, 9.2 is, uh, is uh, to review, receive for possible action uh, the uh, bids on uh, transportation for um, regular education students for the 2018-2019 school year and potentially beyond. Um, do you want to, how do you want to, do you want to summarize what the bids were or, we, we did talk about this quite a bit in yeah. the operations committee meeting. Do you want to? Uh, sure. I, well, I, if you have it up there, maybe your best to, I don't have it open right now. Let me sure, I have it in front of me. I'm happy okay. to just briefly note that um, uh, our current contract for bus transportation expires at the conclusion of this school year. Uh, we put the bid out for um, public bid. Uh, we had um, a bidder's meeting. Uh, we had some significant level of interest. We had five companies attend the, the bidder's meeting, uh, but ultimately we received only two bids um, on our contract. Um, after reviewing those and discussing them with the board, we met with each company. We asked the companies to reconsider the bids and to give us alternates. Uh, we asked them to improve their bids, uh, and we asked our um, incumbent company to price out a one-year extension on the existing contract as well. Um, you have um, an exhibit in front of you um, that lists STA, the incumbent um, company. It lists their original bid. They came back uh, with an option one and option two that improved the numbers on their original bid. You have those in front of you. You also have their proposal for a one-year contract extension. And additionally and finally, you have the original bid that we received from Specialty Transportation Incorporated. Uh, upon meeting with them and view, uh, reviewing the requirements of the bid, they chose not to revise their initial um, bid. But their initial bid remains more favorable than uh, the original or either option one or option two as revised by STA. Um, after a lot of consideration, uh, Mr. Bowden, Mrs. Trudeau, and I all agree that it would be in the board's best interest uh, to award this bid to specialty transportation over the life of the five-year contract. This bid is favorable by approximately $350,000 over STA's best, and I have serious concerns that with the one-year extension, uh, we might lose that savings and find ourselves in a worse situation next year. So uh, while we have had a very positive relationship with STA over the course of this last these last two contracts, um, I feel I have to recommend that the board award this bid to specialty transportation. They are currently the full-time, uh, the full district provider for both Hartford Public Schools and Avon Public Schools, and we have received very positive recommendations. Uh, we've called, we've asked, um, both of those districts give nothing but positive reviews of the work being done and the relationship they have. Um, both companies uh, would be providing um, an updated fleet uh, specialty as they will be new in this area. Uh, we'll be providing all 2018 buses uh, as part of this contract. So that is our recommendation. And the, the, the specialties buses would be new equipment, I think, is what yes, they're bid, they'd be all they're 2018 big buses, correct. Right. right. Well, I mean, you've worked hard on this, and I know we were disappointed that we only got two bids uh, and and I, I, I know that there's been some question in the community as to why did we only get two bids. Well, I can assure you that it wasn't anything we did or did not do. That is just what the market chose to respond to these bids. And I don't know whether that they thought that STA, whether other bidders thought that STA was going to do what they needed to do to keep the contract or that if, if, if there just was an interest because of the capital intensive nature of the, of the service, don't driver know. Shortage. Driver yeah. shortage. Driver shortage. Right. And, and, and to make clear, specialty is a significant increase over what we're currently paying for buses. Mm -hmm. We are currently paying well below market value. Uh, in year one, specialty, which is the lowest bid, 
represents more than a 15 percent increase over the cost of our transportation for services in this current school year um, we we simply had a very same services for the same exact services no enhancement of services we have simply been below market value for the last couple or three years and this is a correction and that's what happens when contracts expire <clears throat> okay well I I don't we talked about it in some length in the uh, mm -hmm. operations committee meeting and I think the board is prepared to accept your recommendation but is there a motion that we approve uh, the uh, regular ed transportation bid for the 2018-19 through 2022-23 school year in the total amount of 12 million four hundred and seven an eight or a six mr. K's an eight, eight. six so <laughs> oh, twelve million four hundred eight thousand six oh three you know we gotta correct you no know, these old people on the board is there a motion to that effect I'll so move. Move. Second. second second any other questions or discussion thank you all in favor aye, aye. opposed okay now I should we, we should also note that I think it's been our the board's hope that to the extent practicable and, and reasonable within the management discretion of, of specialty that they would consider uh, uh, hiring uh, current STA drivers and I know that that has been a practice from other yeah. districts but we, we have made clear uh, to specialty that should they win this award we would expect that they would give first consideration to drivers currently working in Guilford for STA and if I may at this point I would just like to to specially note one employee Marie Illinger has been our manager with STA for the last several years um, and has provided exceptional service to the students the parents and the community of Guilford um, and so while I know that we've made the right decision fiscally um, Marie has been an important part of our team she has worked diligently um, and and we hope that we will have the opportunity to to continue our relationship with Marie um, STA has provided great service but she specifically and individually has provided exceptional service and we thank her for that okay and I, I should note also that obviously we don't have any control uh, under our contract with who who uh, specialty or anybody else hires they, they are employees of a private contractor an independent contractor and we do not as a district have the ability to control either hiring supervision discipline or anything else um, but uh, no, I agree with you. We, we're not dissatisfied with STA. They, they've been, they've provided good service, and I think if we were asked to give a recommendation, we'd probably give one. But without hesitation. Yeah, and no, it, this is just a, it's a fiscal decision. It's a fiscal it's a, decision. It's a money, and, yeah. it's a money issue. So, yeah. Okay. So, um, anything else? Oh, I wanted to ask a question. That now that we've done this, do we we have to start the bid out on the special ed runs, right? Um, the, that will be done. Probably later. a little bit later. We usually do that later in the year. Yeah. Okay. We do that annually and we do it a little bit later in okay. the year. We're at least in a position where we can mm -hmm. set, start setting it up. <coughs> okay. Uh, 9.3 is to receive the annual audit report. Uh, again, uh, talked about it in some detail in the operations committee meeting. But Ms. Cohen, do you want to just summarize what the, um, the finding was? Sure. Um, you know, uh, we had um, another clean audit come back from um, Bloom and Shapiro. And I think... Um, Probably the most notable um, recommendation would be simply um, to get a fraud assessment, and we discussed that as a board, that that is not a bad idea um, going forward. The town is perhaps looking into doing the same, um, and um, that's, that's pretty much what we discussed. And I would just note the auditors are making that recommendation to all of their clients oh, as simple right. good practice. Yes, yes. yes. there is no reason that. to think there's fraud, but just good practice. <laughs> yes. yes, that's exactly right. Yeah. So specifically, the reports say that the accountants, quote, did not identify any deficiencies in internal control over financial reporting that we considered to be material weaknesses. So. That's great, and we've had a clean it's report a for clean report. from years, frankly. Yes. And so I think Ms. Trudeau uh, yes. obviously uh, uh, gets Absolutely. the lion's yes. share of the credit on this because uh, <laughs> you. you know it's a sixty million dollar budget, mm -hmm. and to, to have clean audits years in a row. I mean, Mr. Sands, it doesn't happen in uh, every sixty million dollar operation. Oh, it's not uh, as easy oh, as oh. our business office makes it look. Yeah. It, yes, <laughs> uh, significant credit goes to Linda into her office. Yep. Um, okay, any discussion on that? We did talk about it quite a bit in the operations meeting. Um, 
four is Mr. Doe has asked for a kind of a cash flow budget transfer request of a transfer to special education tuition of $75,000 <coughs> from the teacher salaries line in an in amount of $75,000. Is there a motion to that effect? So moved. Second. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Uh, 9.5 is we've been requested to approve a donation of $4,381 from the Guilford High School Football Touchdown Club that are, is going to be used to pay the salary for an assistant coach for next fall, 2018 season. Uh, is there a motion that we approve that donation? So moved. Second. Second. Any questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. With our thanks, I'm sure you will. With our thanks, and I'll note that we know that there will be questions on assistant coaching stipends for you Thursday evening at the Board of Finance. It would be a great reminder to remind the Board right. of Finance how often our booster clubs pay for those expenses. Very good. 9.6 in the same or similar vein is uh, to approve a $1,580 donation from the Guilford High School Fencing Parents Booster Club. And these, this is for equipment, it looks mm -hmm. like. And I'm not going to, I have no idea what any of those <laughs> well, things well, are. Well, I, uh, <laughs> and in fact, uh, if I may, I am going to uh, mention um, what one of them is because there's a typo here. Um, the, so uh, there's the George scoring machine. So these are scoring machines that are used. Um, um, not only in practice, but at tournaments um, that are um, quite important to the um, to the to the bout and, and to which um, the fencers are literally connected um, mm -hmm. because it's an electronic scoring machine. Um, the one thousand five hundred eighty dollars is for a conductive fabric strip. Strip. Um, so this is um, the strip that that the the students the athletes fence on. Um, and what it does is for two of the three weapons, uh, the foil and the epe, it um, prevents <laughs> a, a touch when it hits the ground. It prevents it from setting the mm -hmm. machine off and stopping play, um, uh, falsely stopping play. And then the third is two floor reels, which are... Keeps um, you from tripping on the cord to which you are attached. Well, no, 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 right, sort of, right, right. They hold the cords to which you're attached and, and, and release... And and um, and give the the fencer flexibility moving forward and back. Um, I can tell you, having gone to uh, several large tournaments recently, um, one of the things that um, a lot of the teams do um, is not only um, do they have these equipment, but they will bring pieces of the equipment to tournaments because no school has enough. So that when we at Gilbert High School held the novice fencing meet. Um, at, Several weeks ago, um, we have other schools who will bring some of this equipment to try to help share all that. But they're they're pretty significant piece of equipment in in uh, in play here. So but it is a, a strip, not a strap. <laughs> <laughs> I take it that's a motion. Then we approve. It is. It is absolutely motion. a motion. Second. Oh, any other discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed. Okay. Uh, Nine point seven is to act on a on a grant application a Title VI grant application in the amount of $10,000 to provide additional school-based mental health services and counseling at Guilford High School. This would be a federal grant? That's take correct. It? Okay. So is there a motion to approve this uh, grant application? So moved. Second. Second. Any other questions, comments? All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Aye. We're doing better. And as we yes. do not have a grant writing position, I would just like to extend our thanks to Dr. Keene, who spent significant time putting this grant together very quickly once we discovered that it was available. Thank you very much. Sure. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, item 10, committee reports. Policy committee, anything happening? Uh, the policy committee is meeting in two weeks, so we will have much more to say after that. Okay. Operations committee. Uh, we've talked a lot about. Yeah, we, talk, we did our the discussed the new bids for the busing. I do think it's worth noting um, that uh, Ms. Biagetti presented us with some exciting things coming down the pike for food service, um, namely for next year, um, but um, things to look out for in the schools. And it's probably worth noting. Uh, Dare I note that um, there, the turf field is yes. um, currently closed because the, the new turf field, the new turf mm -hmm. field is currently closed um, for use and, and likely will be for the spring um, sports season, which we're very disappointed about. Um, the field is under warranty, but there seems to be an operational issue um, 
with the field spit splitting at the 30 yard line. So um, rest assured that we have um, several people on, on the case and um, hopefully we'll get it resolved. Um, we'll work closely with can. Parks and Rec and the Town Standing Building Committee to make sure that we resolve the issue and get it repaired properly as quickly as possible. Correct. Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, curriculum committee? Sorry. We met in January um, and our two topics for the month were um, updates about world languages in the world language program and the next generation science standards. Uh, we had a good presentation from committee members um, about this exciting change and one of the biggest um, changes that we'll see this year is what we're going to pilot the new test that will replace the CMT science that we've been doing for oh, a long okay. time. Okay. Great. <laughs> how, how did that happen? How did, how did, were we chosen to pilot? No, it everyone is. It's actually a field test. Oh, Last okay. year there were some pilots. This year everybody in the state is going to take the next generation science standards um, aligned assessment, which I think will be good for Guilford because then I think it will become very real to teachers once it's on the state test. Oh. And right now it's still kind of this vague thing that's out there. So it gives a new sense of urgency um, a little bit for changing from knowing science to figuring out science and, and behaving like scientists. So uh, that's exciting. It, it does change this year to 11th graders, which is different because in the past it's always been 10th graders taking CAPT. Now it's going to be 11th graders in the next generation science standards, but we'll, we will not receive scores. This when, year. May I ask when? I mean, so that's a, they, they take the SATs in March or April. When does March? Is it? Do you, I, I'm not asking for a date. I'm asking generally, do we know? Yes. <laughs> we know. Okay. That was on the calendar we had in front of us today. <laughs> I know. I don't have the date right in front it's of me. It's not hugely this, important. I'm just the, aware it's not of how designated. Much testing happens a junior year yeah. outside mm -hmm. and inside school. It there. is not designated by the state like the SAT is. Right. So the, the school gets to choose the day. Oh, interesting. Okay. And so uh, they've already selected a day. They've been considering any other conflicts. Right. Mm -hmm. I believe so. it's in April and SAT day is in March. Mm -hmm. Definitely SAT day is in March. Okay. Anything else on curriculum? No? Uh, town committee liaisons, any, anybody? I, I always um, mention this here, and it's not really a town committee, I just don't know where else to put it, which is the um, uh, Health and Wellness Committee, which is a committee within the district, um, um, which is uh, headed by um, uh, Jill Rabin, one of our deans here at the high school, but includes teachers, um, including physical education teachers and community members and Board of Ed liaisons. We met um, in the past couple of weeks. Um, one of the things we have been working on is looking at the forms that teachers fill out um, asking permission to use food in the classroom for curricular activities, and then the report form that comes from each of the um, principals at the end of the year kind of compiling information and reporting back to the committee. Um, so we were looking at these forms to try to make them um, A, more user friendly and B, kind of provide useful, useful information which will then eventually come to the board but also will, um, instead of being a simple kind of reporting of what happened, um, be a way for the district leadership to look at what's going on in their schools and perhaps um, improve where they need to improve, um, but also recognize where things are going well. Okay. Any other town liaisons? No. All right. I think to report. All right. Uh, Learn board of directors. Somebody go. I did. You I did. attended the most Correct. recent, and um, we had an interesting presentation by the East Haddam. Superintendent of Schools, whose name is escaping me, but I'm looking on Google. Brian Reese. Brian Reese, uh, who presented um, the STEM efforts in uh, really K through 12 at East Haddam, an interesting presentation. And, um, and that's about it to report from that meeting. They look forward to 
seeing a revolving group of us, I explain that they'll see a fresh face, have the opportunity to see a fresh face every month. Okay. Thank well, thanks for going. That's, that yes. is really good for us yeah. to try to do that. Yep. <coughs> okay. Uh, public questions? Anybody? All right. Then uh, is there a motion to adjourn? There is. A second? Yes. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Thank you very much.